Do you enjoy creepy horror stories? Be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell for more spooky videos from Scare Street. Caveville by A.I. Nasser. Caveville was evil. The stories were plenty, and my father usually had a damn good time telling them to me. He'd relate one happening after the other, always just before bedtime, making sure I went to sleep with enough demons in my head to host a party. I remember my mother chastising him about it, and how he'd always raise his hands up in mock defeat, telling me that, "'The old ball and chain has spoken, son,' just before sending me off to bed, alone." I think he secretly enjoyed it. It was the New England part of him, the gene that always made sure everyone knew just how messed up that part of the world was. Connecticut, he used to tell me, was the breeding ground for everything that was wrong with this country. All the things that scraped against the outside of your window on a stormy night or knocked on the inside of your closet door when you knew there was nothing behind it. And in the middle of it all was Caveville. Or at least that's what my father believed. The old man had a weird sense of humor, and as I grew older his stories became a little more ludicrous every year. The girl who ran away because she had done the nasty with a demon. The vengeful spirit in an old Victorian whose husband had been cheating on her. The curse of the Crawford family, jumping from one generation to the other. A thing of nightmares, Benji. Don't ever go back. And I didn't. Since the day I was born and for the thirty years that followed, Caveville had always been just a name to me a town that was no different than any other coastal fishing town no one's ever heard of. And to be frank, I was more than content with leaving it that way. After all, I had no connections to it. No family was waiting for the return of their prodigal son. For all I knew, my father had probably never even been there himself and had made the whole thing up. Whatever happens, Benji, you steer clear of that town. You hear me, boy? Loud and clear, old man. I closed my eyes and pinched the bridge of my nose, taking in deep breaths as I fought to stay awake at the wheel. It was a long drive from Minnesota, and the weather wasn't helping. It was like winter was having a tantrum and decided to give one last hurrah before storming out and slamming the door behind it. In the falling rain, I could barely see a few yards ahead of me, and the constant swishing of the windshield wipers had slowly become an annoying drumming in the back of my head. Twenty-one hours, fourteen hundred miles. You're a royal pain in the ass, you know that? I looked down at the urn, sitting majestically on the passenger seat of my Honda Civic. My father's initials etched into the copper coating with the perfect cursive only a funeral parlor could pull off. A.P. Alan Phillips. The two letters looked like they were smiling at me, as if my father were laughing at how, even in death, he was putting me through another nightmare. I wish you were alive, I sighed as I pulled away from the curb. At least then I could make sure Mom gave you hell for this. It was another twenty minutes before I saw the Caveville welcome sign. Proud town of population 2800. The words painted in a neon yellow that even the rain couldn't hide. I steeled myself, gripped the steering wheel harder as the car swerved a bit and eased off the gas. I fully intended to get in and out within a day. I didn't need an accident slowing me down. You'd be just another story, Benji. Another tale a father tells his son. And you sure had a lot of those, didn't you, Pops? I smiled to myself.
The main road into town was, thankfully, empty. Although it was almost four in the afternoon, the gray skies made it seem like dusk, and through the sheets of rain I could barely make out a few people walking briskly along the sidewalks under the protection of store canopies. The wind had picked up, and the rain battered against my windshield, making it almost impossible for me to keep going. I slowed the car down and gently pulled into a parking spot beside a Ford F-150 that had seen better days. Turning off the engine, I peered at the storefronts, trying to see who was still crazy enough to stay open in this weather. The light of what looked like a grocery store acted as a small beacon of hope in the raging storm. I pulled my coat tighter around me, slid the hood over my head, and patted my father's urn. You stay right here, I said. Don't go anywhere, and don't talk to strangers. I waited, almost expecting a reply, and then chuckled as I opened the door to the elements. The rain rushed in like a screaming child, eager and gleeful, and I had to use both hands to force the door closed. Tightening the straps of my hood and hunching my shoulders, I raced toward the store. The hanging canopy clinked and swished in the wind, and for a brief moment I hesitated, waiting to see if it would break free. The falling rain quickly found its way through my coat and forced me to keep going until I shouldered my way into the welcoming warmth of the store. Not the best of afternoons to be driving around. I looked up at the woman smiling at me from behind the counter, her hands poised over a few cartons of cigarettes she had apparently been emptying onto the shelves behind her. Her hair was tied back in a high ponytail, and the ACDC shirt she wore contrasted heavily with the small-town girl look she had going on. I returned the smile, slid my hood back, and shook my head. Definitely not. Best find yourself a place to lay low, she continued. Wherever you're going, you won't get far in that. Probably just lock myself in the car and take a nap. I replied. Been driving for so long I don't know if it's the rain or a lack of sleep that's blurring my vision. Little bit of both, I bet, the woman said, returning to her task. There's a nice little bed and breakfast round the corner. Sally can probably set you up. She gave me a once-over and met my eyes. Besides, it ain't tourist season just yet. My smile widened. Not a tourist. Well, not technically. I gestured toward the cigarettes. I'd like two packs of those and a bottle of water. Water's in the back, the woman replied, and pushed two packs out of her pile, then leaned on the counter and waited. I thanked her, made my way to the fridge with the bottled water, and returned with two and a pack of Cheetos. The woman kept her eyes on me as she bagged my things and gave me back my change. Her green eyes sparkled mischief and a whole lot of curiosity. I caught myself absently checking her naked ring finger. Around the corner, huh? She nodded. Best walk it. Shouldn't be driving in this weather. Thanks, uh... Kristen, she said. You take care. I nodded and gave her one last smile before pulling my hood up and exiting into the storm. One night? It's all I need. Sally Johnson, as her name tag proudly proclaimed, looked like she was fresh out of college. She gave me a quick and uneasy smile as she took my credit card, almost dropped it, then apologized under her breath. Typing away the information into the computer, her eyes kept flicking back every so often to the urn under my arm. It's our honeymoon, I said, gently tapping the urn. Her eyes widened in surprise, and I laughed. The old man, I explained, said he wanted to see the beach one last time. Oh, sure. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Her flustering was almost adorable. It's fine, I chuckled. I'd be a little freaked out, too. 
Her cheeks blushed, and in her embarrassment forgot to return my card when she handed me the key to my room. I'm gonna need that, I said, pointing at the American Express. Oh, right. She shook her head. Sorry, my mom usually handles things around here. I just sit in during the dead months. It's not really tourist season. I heard, I said. Don't worry, I'll be out of your hair tomorrow. Breakfast is at eight, she called after me, as if she had just remembered to share the information. Bright and early, Miss Johnson. I took the stairs by twos. The second floor landing felt like a scene out of some prairie movie. Flowers in vases decorating the hall, cute little chandeliers with electric candles, and bright colored carpets and wallpaper. If it hadn't been for the storm and the eeriness that came with it, I would have appreciated the furnishing efforts a lot more. From the number on my key, my room was at the end of the hall. Hope it has a view, eh, Pops? I shrugged off my coat and began massaging the kinks out of my neck as I made my way towards it. A muffled sound came from behind one of the other doors, and I frowned. Thought it wasn't tourist season. Then again, it would be stupid of me to think that I was the only guest. More muted sounds, this time much closer to the door, followed by the scraping of a chair and the clinking of glass. Something fell and smashed against the floor. My curiosity peaked. I stopped to try and determine what was going on. More noise, more scraping, and another shattering of glass forced me to act. I knocked. Everything all right in there? A hand slammed against the door from inside, rattling it in its frame. It sent me scurrying back against the opposite wall. Mind your own business. The hiss in the voice, the anger that seemed to seep out through the thin space of the threshold, thickened the air around me. The chandelier lights flickered, and for a second, my imagination tricked me into thinking I could almost see through the door at the face staring back at me. I spun away and rushed to my room. I ignored the sounds of more shattering glass and quickly unlocked my door, closing it behind me and making sure to lock it twice. Morning! Sally waved at me from behind the desk, all smiles and bashfulness, her bright mood a stark contrast to the way I felt. I grunted, pushed my sunglasses further up my nose, and licked my dry lips. Sleep had been hell. If the people in the neighboring room valued privacy, as they had so eagerly pointed out, it sure didn't show. The walls of the B&B &B were thin, and through them I had been given the unique pleasure of a front-row seat to Battle of the Titans. It was almost as if there had been a war waged in there, and it kept me up for most of the night thinking about just how much some people loved their kink. Already running on a schedule, no need to sleep in. Right, I'd just get some shut-eye on the drive home. Any damn motel would do compared to this. Breakfast's ready, Sally chirped. I winced and gave her the best it's-too-early-to-be-happy look I could muster. Can you talk just a little quieter? I think your voice is echoing in my head. Sally immediately deflated, and her cheeks turned red very quickly. Sorry. Don't apologize. I replied. It's me, not you. Not a morning person. She ventured a smile, and it disappeared as soon as she realized I wasn't going to return it. Well, breakfast's ready. Table for two? I frowned. Two? You and your father, she said, smiling. I shook a finger at her. Hey, you. You're funny, you. I waved and made for the door when I remembered that maybe somebody ought to check on the other guests. If last night were anything to go by, somebody was probably injured or dead up there. 
or had just made a mess that was enough to get them tossed out, which would have suited me just fine. I wanted a good look at the bastard who had slammed his hand against the door and scared the hell out of me. Room next to mine, I said, taking off my glasses and rubbing the sleep out of my eyes. Made a lot of noise, kept me up for most of the night. I think you'd better check on them and make sure everything's okay. What kind of noise? Sally asked. Not the good kind, I replied. Just be careful, the guy in there's got major anger management issues. Sally's frown deepened. Guy? she asked. Yup, I nodded. I tried knocking, but he really threw a fit. Only other guest here is Mrs. Logan, Sally said, tapping away at the computer and shaking her head in confusion. Well, apparently Mrs. Logan likes it rough. I said, walking towards the front door. Take someone with you in case you walk in on them clad in leather and handcuffed to the bed. Kayville was a whole different town in the morning. One could almost say it was brimming with life. The streets were full of people walking to and from different stores. Cars idled their way along the streets and pulled into parking spots beside dozens of others. There was a general hum of vitality that made me think I had been in a completely different town the night before. I watched the life around me with a bit of appreciation, despite the need for a bowl of coffee to fight the headache building up behind my eyes. Propping my father's urn on top of my car, I fished for my keys and almost jumped when a finger tapped me on the shoulder. I see you survived the night. Kristen's smile was contagious. Yep, I beamed. You were right about the B&B, &B, although they really need to pick their guests more thoroughly. Oh? She gave me a look that school teachers reserved for elementary kids who were about to start whining. Did little old Mrs. Logan keep you up with all her typing? If you want to call it that, sure. What would you call it? What a woman does behind closed doors is her business, I said, raising my hands up in mock surrender. I'm not one to judge. Clearly, Kristen smirked. You need help with that? She gestured to the urn, and I dutifully picked it up and tapped it. Me and the old man are going to see the beach, I said. You're welcome to join if you got the time. I rather think this is a private matter, Kristen said. Wouldn't want to intrude on a father-son outing. Trust me, I winked. Dad here would love the company. One last audience as he floats across the Atlantic. Kristen looked at the urn, then back at me. All right. Seriously? Sure, she said. Don't you have a store to run or something? Backing out of the offer, are ye? I laughed. <laughs> no, not at all. Just unexpected is all. We're homey people in Kayville, Kristen said. Got to keep the tourists happy. Still not a tourist. Still not buying it, Kristen winked. We got into the car, and Dad had to take the back seat as Kristen slid into the seat beside me. Her skirt rode up a little, and I caught myself staring before quickly turning away and holding on to the steering wheel with both hands. She was definitely attractive, but I fully intended to be out of town before nightfall. And... I wasn't the kind of guy who would take a dip in the local water, then skip out. Luckily, though, Kristen didn't say anything, even if she had noticed. Instead, she guided me along the streets of Caveville, pointing out a few things here and there that she thought I might be interested in, and led me to a small stretch of beach a little past the lighthouse. 
I had to admit, the company really was nice, and between friendly conversation about last night's weather and a short synopsis of her life growing up in Caveville, we found ourselves standing barefoot in the sand with the Atlantic stretched out before us. It's beautiful, ain't it? She whispered as we both gazed out at the clear blue. Never understood, Beaches, I replied. How so? City boy, I said, bowing slightly. My parents grew up here, left before I was born. I was raised in one city after the other, moving around constantly. Give me concrete jungles and I'm all yours. Sounds a bit much. It can be, I admitted. But it's home. Guess your father thought different. I looked at her, taking in the gentle line of her jaw and the high cheekbones as she continued to stare out at the ocean. Why is that? She looked at me, and in the sunlight, her eyes took on a bright gleam. Brought you all the way out here, didn't he? I chuckled as I unscrewed the top of the urn. He always had a weird sense of humor. I took a few steps forward until I was ankle-deep in the water, then shook my dad out of his confines and let the wind do the rest. Happy flying, Pops, I said, my eyes watering just a bit. Hope it's all you hoped it was. I ended up staying a lot longer than I expected to. Kristen invited me for a cup of coffee a few streets away from the beach, a peculiar little place that was bustling with the afternoon crowd, but we were still able to find a relatively quiet place to enjoy our brew. In the distance, I could see the ocean stretching out to the horizon, and the backdrop of greenery made the whole thing feel like a scene out of a fairy tale. When I mentioned this to Kristen, she only laughed and shook her head. More the Brothers Grimm. The stories my old man had told me hadn't been his imagination after all. They were more like urban legends around here. How much of it was based on truth and how much was exaggerated to spice the tales up, I couldn't tell. But Kristen knew them all. And she told them almost the same way my father had. It made me feel like the town needed a small library dedicated to the freakish happenings that took place here. Kristen said Caveville actually had one. Well, not a real library. More of a speculative column in the Caveville Tribune. You're joking, I chuckled. You have to be joking. She shook her head after taking a sip of her coffee. Calvin Holmes runs the paper, and he's got everything on file. I reckon if you pass by Sheriff Garland, he'll back up a bunch of them. Really? I frowned. Didn't know law enforcement had boiled down to chasing the boogeyman. Everything's got a story, Kristen said. And Garland's been round for most of it. They'd eat me alive if I spoke a word of any of this back home. Oh? Yeah, I smiled. Boys at the station would question my sanity. Kristen's eyebrows shot up. Didn't know you were a policeman. Detective, actually. Impressive, Kristen smirked. You don't look it. I left my mustache back in 1994. She almost choked, laughing and spilling most of her coffee onto the table. I motioned for the waiter to help us salvage as much of our dignity as possible. So, is the B&B &B haunted? I asked. Everything's haunted, Kristen said. Houses, the school gymnasium. Hell, some even think Roger Flinch's dog's possessed. We're definitely an entertaining bunch, and we rub off on our guests, it seems. Right, I nodded. Like that author guy you mentioned earlier, what's his name? Crick. Never heard of him. Romance writer, 
wrote one good horror book, Christian said. Wrote it in the greenhouse before it burned down three years ago. Some say his wife killed June Summers, the woman who owned the grocery store before me. Nothing's stuck, and Garland's been quiet since the fire. And you have the Crawford curse. Sam and her children still live here, Kristen added. But they're fine. Curse only goes through the male side of the family. How about the girl who skipped town? Which one? I raised an eyebrow. Many girls disappear around here? Kristen laughed. Sure. There's Ashley McLean. Demon lover? One and the same. Kristen nodded. Before my time, so I couldn't really tell you much, but my mother said she was definitely pregnant. No one's heard of her since, or the babe. But there's this author, Kyle Ashfield. Lots of his stories are just variations on the ones we tell tourists here. Rumors are Ashley's made a good life for herself somewhere, and that Kyle's her boy. A lot of horror authors coming through here. It's Connecticut. Kristen shrugged. Something in the water. I laughed at that. Who else? Kristen raised her eyebrows in confusion. You said there were other girls who disappeared. Ah, she nodded. Tara Frey, up and left one day, didn't tell a soul. I used to babysit her son Jimmy when his father ran out on him. I scoffed and shook my head. You really got a madhouse here, don't you? Sure, she winked. The Coles lost their entire family when they moved to the old ranger farm. Only the father and son left. Gina Andrews talks to herself all the time in a language no one's ever heard of. Some say she's a witch. And that B&B you're staying in, definitely haunted. And you sent me there to spend the night? Only place that's open this time of year, she said. It's not... Tourist season, I finished for her. Yeah, I heard. Sally was a completely different person when I walked back into the B&B &B that night. Her eyes were sunken, her hair was tied back awkwardly, with several strands loose across her face, and she was biting her nails with a vengeance. She looked like she had not slept in days, which was a stark difference from the chirpy girl who had greeted me this morning. She barely looked up from the computer when I walked in. Long day? I asked. She's dead, Sally mumbled. Excuse me? Mrs. Logan, came the soft reply. You were right. Someone was with her last night. She's dead. Oh, my God. Last night's across-the-wall freak show came back to me in hauntingly clear echoes. What happened? We don't know, Sally said. But the sheriff was looking for you. Must have been going about it all wrong, I said. I've been in town all day. Caveville isn't that big. Sally shook her head quickly. I gave him your information, and he ran it through the system. He found out you were a detective and said he'd handle it. You usually give out guest information without a warrant? I don't know! Sally almost screamed. She was frantic and on the verge of losing it completely. My mom's out of town and Sheriff Garland... Well, he's Sheriff Garland. He's everyone's granddad. She suddenly looked at me and went very pale. You're not going to arrest me, are you? I grabbed her hand and squeezed. Hey, calm down, I said softly. I'm not arresting anyone. I'll go to the sheriff in the morning and we'll sort it out. You're not in trouble, Sally. Promise. She nodded and turned back to the computer, then suddenly looked back at me. You're not going up there, are you? Sure I am, I said. I still need a place to sleep. But the other room, she mumbled. It's taped off. There was so much blood. My mom's going to kill me. 
She broke into tears, and I quickly rounded the counter and took her into my arms. I tried to calm her down, kept assuring her that everything was okay. She shook like a leaf in my embrace, and I beat myself up a hundred times for not being a little more assertive last night. Oh, come on, Benji. You've had neighbors who loved their BDSM. Sounded pretty much the same. It was a lame excuse, though. When's your mom coming back? Tomorrow. Do you have somewhere to go? I can't leave, she sobbed. I have to stay here. Don't worry, I'm here, I assured her, holding her at arm's length and looking her in the eye. Whatever happened, it's over. Just go home and I'll hold down the fort. Sally nodded slightly, then started to collect her things. She really isn't cut out for this. For all she knows, I could rob the place and get the hell out of Dodge before anyone noticed. I made a mental note to have a chat with her mother. I walked her out and waited until she got into her car and pulled away. Then I closed the door and bolted it, sighing heavily as I ran my hand through my hair. Great, Benji. Just great. Depending on how tomorrow went with the sheriff, I was going to definitely be here for a while. When I reached the second floor landing, I decided I would probably never appreciate its decor. The storm had ruined the appeal last night, and tonight the yellow tape across Mrs. Logan's bedroom door was enough to make my stomach turn. I'd been to countless crime scenes, but for some reason this one irked me, and I hadn't even been inside the room. It probably had to do with the memory of last night, and that face I could have sworn I had seen. Or maybe I had been too caught up in just fulfilling my father's dying wish that I hadn't bothered to listen to my gut instinct. Either one of them would be enough to keep me up all night. I walked past Mrs. Logan's door, and a part of me itched to push past the yellow tape and let myself in. It didn't matter that I didn't have the key to the room. There had to be a master somewhere in the office downstairs, if I really wanted to get in. But I didn't. I wanted to get some sleep, and then give my statement in the morning and drive home. The sheriff and local authorities could deal with Mrs. Logan's room on their own. The sound of a scraping chair across the hardwood floor stopped me. Memories, your mind's sick idea of nostalgia. Keep moving. I closed my eyes, took a deep breath, and took a tentative step forward. The scraping came again. I turned to look at the door, part of me half expecting it to creak open. The scraping came again, this time faster, and the door shook in its frame as the chair was hurtled against it. I fell back, head slamming against the opposite wall, the deja vu of it all making my mind spin. A soft chuckle came from behind the closed door, and then a knock. Told you to mind your own business. The voice was the same from last night. I instantly jumped to my feet and raced to my room. Gun, the killer's back. I fumbled with the keys. A frantic pounding issued on Mrs. Logan's door again. It quickly became a series of barrages, coupled with the hoarse, screaming laughter of the man inside. Mind your own business, Benji! Mind your own business! I fell into my room and kicked the door shut. In an instant, I was on my feet and reaching for the bedside table where I had stashed my gun, stupidly believing it would be in bad taste to take it with me while I scattered the old man's ashes. I opened the drawer just as the bombardment of slamming fists cascaded onto my own door. Clicking off the safety, I turned and fell to one knee, gun aimed at the hammering. It stopped. My heart pounded in my chest, 
threatening to break open my ribs and seek its own safety, away from whatever the hell was in the hall. I tried to control my breathing. My hands were steady, the gun aimed true, but a chill raced down my spine. I told you to mind your own business. The voice was barely a whisper, but in the darkness around me, in the stillness that had fallen upon the quaint little B&B, &B, it could have been coming through a megaphone. I counted to ten, slowly, waiting for my heartbeat to slow down and my breathing to return to normal. Mind your own business. He was singing it, chuckling while he said it. And Sally was going to be in here alone with him, damn it. I slowly stood up, my aim never wavering. I kept my eyes locked on the door, and a part of me wondered if anyone would judge me for shooting a bullet through the thin wood and into the bastard behind it. Movement from the corner of my eye caught my attention, and I twisted around, gun ready. I stared at my reflection in the large mirror over the bureau against the far wall. But it wasn't me. Not quite. It looked like me. It held the same stance, stood in the same room, wore the same clothes. But it definitely wasn't me. My reflection smiled, and I swear that smile almost stretched from one ear to the other. It slowly lowered the gun, held its hands out, and took a bow. Then it lifted the gun once more, slammed the muzzle against its head, and pulled the trigger. I flinched, the sound of the gunshot deafening in the room, and watched my reflection drop, lifeless, to the floor. Do it, the voice from the other end of the door whispered. Do it, or I'll come in and help you. I swept the gun from the mirror to the door and back again. The knocking recommenced, and a little child began to sing Itsy Bitsy Spider as the knob slowly turned. I fixed my aim on the door, waiting to shoot and kill whatever would decide to be stupid enough to come inside. That gun won't do much, kiddo. I turned back to the mirror. The reflection was different now, a room similar to mine, but the furniture in all the wrong places. A woman sat at the center table, the clicking of her typewriter adding to the ice running through my veins. The child continued to sing, the knob continued to slowly turn left and right. He came into my room, and I never left again. The old woman looked at me, and she smiled. Blood began to pour out of her mouth. With an ear-piercing scream, she raced at me, slamming against the mirror just as I let a round go. The mirror's glass shattered to a thousand pieces and rained down on the bureau. The man behind the door laughed. Didn't your father tell you not to come back, Benji? The man hissed. He warned you, but you wouldn't mind your own business. Wasn't exactly my choice, buddy. Stay a bit longer, Benji, and we can play. Oh, we have so many nice games here. We'll have a grand old time, you and I, Benji. A grand old time. The knob rattled, but the door remained closed, and the hammering began again, shaking it in its frame. There are so many games, Benji. So many games. I turned around, aimed my gun at the picture window, and let another round go. The glass collapsed in shards that littered the floor just as the door erupted open and a gust of hot air slammed into my back. Not daring to look behind me, I raced towards my newly formed exit and jumped. The cackling laughter of a madman followed me. So you're staying? 
Kristen looked at my bandaged arm before her eyes met mine, her coffee held tightly between both hands. Garland's got me on a tight leash, I replied, wincing as I shifted in my seat. The drop from the B&B's second floor had broken my arm, but luckily nothing else. Just a bunch of scratches and bruises, and a hefty bill to replace the picture window and mirror I had broken. No one seemed to be too concerned with why I had been shooting up the room or why I had jumped. That only made it worse. Well, you can stay in the room for as long as you want, Kristen said. Just make sure you don't shoot anything. I smiled. The fact that she was giving me the room over her garage rent-free for the next few weeks was enough to make me feel like I owed her the world. Kristen eyed me for a few minutes before she took a sip from her coffee. Go ahead, I said. She looked at me in feigned confusion. Oh, come on. I know you want to ask me about it. No, she said, shaking her head nonchalantly. I don't really. You're not just a little curious? You gave your statement, said you thought Mrs. Logan's killer had come back, she said. She looked me in the eye, hard and long. I believe you. No, you don't, I smiled. You want to hear a ghost story. Ghost stories are for tourists, Benji, Kristen smirked. And it definitely wasn't tourist season. We hope you enjoyed this story. Are you looking for more creepy horror stories? Click the link in the description or search Scare Street on Audible for a list of all our bone-chilling titles. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more spooky videos from Scare Street. See you in the shadows.